Welcome back to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. Joining us now to talk about the year ahead are CBS News Foreign Affairs Correspondent Margaret Brennan, Chief White House Correspondent Major Garrett, Homeland Security and Justice Department Correspondent Jeff Pegues, and our Chief Legal Correspondent Jan Crawford, National Security Correspondent David Martin, and Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes. Welcome to all of you to our Thanksgiving dinner here. Major, I want to start with you. Sure. Thanksgiving on Christmas. Uh, you spent the year with Donald Trump. What do you expect from Donald Trump right away? So I think the country better brace itself for a couple of political realities. First of all, you have a largely non-ideological president surrounding himself by conservative ideologues, and he has the largest Republican majorities that a conservative-oriented Republican president has had since before the Great Depression. This Trump administration will have a largely cooperative Republican Congress, and they will move with as much speed as they possibly can, understanding the Democrats are still in disarray. The Democrats are going to have to pick their targets. They're going to create as many targets as possible for the Democrats, hoping to overwhelm them and to move both on a regulatory, executive action, and legislative front, and throw in a Supreme Court nominee all right out of the gate, an amazing sort of action to push forward an agenda they hope will be, if not fully realized, nearly fully realized by August, and then sit back and watch what happens. Nancy, a flurry of activity. It's a dream come true for Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, it sounds like. It really is, uh, and a dream that started far before he became Speaker. And so uh, when you've got a big prize like this, many prizes, they hope, uh, sitting on the table, you're willing to overlook a lot. So a lot of the things that you heard Paul Ryan criticizing uh, Donald Trump for during the primaries, uh, you won't hear over the next few months. He is going to try to stay as silent as possible. He needs Donald Trump, and Donald Trump needs needs him. First thing right out of the gate, repealing Obamacare. Uh, Republicans will try to do that in the first few weeks of the new Congress. The big question becomes, what then? They know they want to replace it with something, but there's absolutely no consensus on what that something is. David, let me ask you a question. One of the things Donald Trump promised, and it seems like Paul Ryan is going to help him achieve, is a lot more military spending. Mm -hmm. What's the view inside the military of that increased spending and this new commander-in-chief? Well. Of course, he first has to get out from under sequestration, which I assume the Republicans will do for him. Um, Those budget caps that limit the, the amount of spending on military. And once you get out from under that, they also want to increase the size of the military. If Donald Trump serves only one term, I'm not sure there'll be enough time for the military to get significantly larger in that period of time, because it's not just a matter of bringing in more recruits. It's what kind of recruits. They don't need more riflemen. They need more cyber warf warfare uh, experts and, and things like that. Jan, let me ask you before, I want to ask you about Donald Trump's pick for the Supreme Court. But first, I want to ask you about just what does the court have coming up uh, in this next year? that uh, are there big cases i mean the justices clearly uh, decided to kind of take not take the year off but certainly kind of avoid any major controversial cases so this is a term that does not have the blockbuster cases that we've seen in years past whether obamacare same-sex marriage affirmative action um, this is going to be a term that is focused across the street on the U.S. Senate and the confirmation of the next justice to replace, you know, conservative icon Justice Scalia. And so what do you expect from that fight? Well, you know, Trump released a list before the election of, of potential nominees that he would consider. And my sources say he is sticking to that list. They have narrowed it down to just a handful of highly qualified, very respective, uh, respected appellate court judges. I mean, these are conservative legal rock stars. I mean, this is not going to be a battle over qualifications. This will be a battle over ideology. Any top names yes, uh, to yeah. play this ridiculous yeah, I mean, I game, think, but I'll start it anyway. No, 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 because this is ongoing right now. This is something, to Major's point, they are going to move quickly on this. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're, they're narrowing their focus on a handful, like I said, of appellate court judges. Bill Pryor from the Atlanta-based Federal Appeals Court, Thomas Hardiman, uh, a judge on the Philadelphia-based Appeals Court, Steve Colleton from out in Iowa on the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Eighth Circuit, a judge Diane Sykes on the Seventh Circuit, and uh, Joan Larson on the Michigan Supreme Court. But again, all highly qualified. You, you can't argue with their credentials. Jeff, let me ask you about the FBI director. He had a pretty tough end of 2016. He certainly did. Um, what's the state of things inside the FBI, and what about the director himself? Well, I think there's a lot of concern about what happens next 
from what I'm hearing from sources and people who know uh, James Comey, uh, there has been no contact yet with President-elect Trump, and so a lot of people are trying to see where will this go? Will he stay on or will he resign? Uh, because as you know, he is a lightning rod in Washington, D.C. right now. I think he has critics on both sides of the aisle. Uh, he may see that as a, as a good place to be because he sees himself as above politics as the FBI director. But he's facing a lot of criticism, and not only from people on Capitol Hill, but also former agents who've questioned some of his tactics over the last six months. So he is really, and the FBI for that matter, is facing uncertain times right now. And here's something very unusual. A lot of Democrats blame Jim Comey for Hillary Clinton's loss, but a lot of Democrats don't want him to leave either because they don't want to give Donald Trump uh, license to be involved in choosing a new FBI director. It's a matter of the devil you know. Margaret, let me ask you about uh, President Obama, who you were covering at the end of his administration. We haven't had a situation since Woodrow Wilson lived in Washington, D.C. as a president who comes out of office lives in Washington. What do you expect? Well, you won't have that dramatic exit in Marine One when you just have to drive over to Calorama um, right. on, on January 20th. Uh, but Take I, an Uber. <laughs> practically. Um, so you're seeing the White House, the president has said, I want to sort of coach in some ways the president-elect through this transition, uh, very sort of gently saying, Look, he is an amateur, but saying, I'm going to help him try to navigate this major bureaucracy uh, that is the federal government. The Twitter account of the White House is now in federal records for all time. And that Twitter account will become Donald Trump's on January 20th. That weight of those words is going to not only be amplified around the world, but sealed in our history. So how he starts to communicate once he takes that office is going to have profound effects. And I think that's something that certainly President Obama has tried to quietly suggest to him. Let me ask you about the the world that Donald Trump inherits, either through Donald Trump or through his Secretary of State. Uh, what do you think the first things are that they have to do or they should do, given the way the world is looking at the incoming Trump presidency? Well, the diplomats I talked to would tell you, you know, there are two things people hate when it's financial markets or it's foreign policy, and that's unpredictability. And right now, what Donald Trump is suggesting is that the U.S. will be a source of insecurity, perhaps some uncertainty when it comes to decision making, that he's not going to lean on the coalitions, the NATOs, the UNs of the world, like President Obama has tried to emphasize, that he's going to have more of a transactional relationship with global leaders. The test of that is now you're going to have Rex Tillerson, a Secretary of State, who understands full well the weight of words because he moves global markets with them as the chief executive of ExxonMobil. Can he play cleanup and really sort of work out some of those rough edges on the foreign policy front for Donald Trump? He ran on, as an unpredictable. That was his selling point. Uh, one, of Trump. Them, Trump. one of them. Uh, and it's important what Margaret brings up, because if you want to understand Trump, I really recommend, and this is not to sell his book, but if you read Art of the Deal, you get a, a sense of who he is and what he became on the campaign trail. And one of the things he says very early on in that book is, I like to work the phones. I make 100 calls a day. I like to crack open conversations and see where they go. The China-Taiwan thing is a classic example that he wants to crack open that conversation, see where it goes, see what happens, unsettle things, get on the phone, and then see what happens mm -hmm. and see where it leads. There is not an organizing structure to the foreign policy. Once you crack open a conversation, yes, you can make a new deal, but what are you in pursuit of? Right. What are you trying to accomplish? David, I want to get your take on also what does the Pentagon worry most about in terms of threat from the world? Well, if you listen to what uh, James Mattis, who we can assume I think is going to be the next Secretary of Defense, says, the biggest short-term threat is Russia, the biggest long-term threat is China, and the biggest threat to stability in the Middle East is Iran. And that's not a uh, particularly unconventional World view, I would think that uh, most members of the Obama administration hold that that same view. I think where uh, Mattis will differ from the Obama administration is he believes in pushing back. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean going to war, because he's also said many times that before you go to war, you got to think it all the way through and be sure you can sustain it. But I think it will mean. Uh, more frequent and visible shows of force. We've just had this incident where the Chinese uh, stole that underwater uh, drone from a Navy research vessel. The incident that happened 
you knew in the Obama administration what was going to happen. They were going to play that as low-key as possibly and, and keep it from uh, being an irritant in the overall relationship. We've got no idea what Donald Trump will do the, the first time somebody makes off with a drone. I mean, he tweeted, let him keep it. Um, but as president, when somebody makes off with your sovereign property, he may have a, an entirely different point of view. And how, how worried are they about North Korea? <clears throat> I think North Korea is, is the uh, unanswered and so far unsolvable problem that the U.S. faces. Kim Jong-un seems to have made a strategic decision. He's going to get a nuclear arsenal no matter what the cost in economic sanctions. So it is only a matter of time before North Korea has a genuine capability to launch a nuclear weapon against the United States. And the question is, is Donald Trump going to sit there and let that happen? Jeff, let me ask you about <clears throat> Russia. Uh, the, we have this at the end of 2016, the gap between the president who was getting ready to retaliate against Russia for hacking and the president-elect who didn't even think that was a serious finding on the part of the intelligence agencies. When Donald Trump heard about the, the hacking, said, you know, remember, this is, these are the same people who thought there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. A kind of a big shot at the intelligence agency he's, he's going to have to work with. Yeah, and I, I think it, within the intelligence community, that was a shot across the bow. I think there was a lot of concern about how the president-elect handled that and how he will handle the intelligence community going forward. And let me ask you a question about the attorney general, Senator Jeff Sessions. What changes should people be looking for in that area? He is someone who I think is, is quite conservative and, and believes strongly in um, the right position, by right I mean the conservative position, in terms of how you're going to run that Justice Department. I think what's going to be very interesting, and we'll get an early kind of clue uh, for how Democrats are going to react to some of these nominations. Um, the outside groups are really beating Senator Sessions up right now over some of his past history. Uh, they're trying to make this kind of questions of race going back 30 and 40 years. Uh, the Democrats on the committee are going to try to focus on, to your point, how he will run that department, what it will mean for voting rights and immigration. Will he implement some of these hardline policies uh, that's been suggested on the campaign trail? So that actually could have an impact on the Justice Department, unlike the Supreme Court, which uh, when you talk about change and, and uh, Trump President-elect Trump coming in here and kind of upending Washington and turning the tables upside down. He will not change the Supreme Court. Uh, even if he nominates one of the, the nominees that we've been talking about, uh, conservative, strong conservatives, they will be, that nominee will be replacing a conservative icon, Justice Scalia. It will not change the balance of the Supreme Court, the direction of the Supreme Court at all. I want to talk to you about that in a second, and we'll get and answer your thoughts about how the Democrats are going to respond to all of this in a second. But let's take a break, and we'll do that, and we'll be back in a moment. And we're back with more from our CBS correspondent roundtable. Nancy, I want to start with you picking up on the point that Jan was making about uh, what Democrats are going to do to resist uh, the uh, Mr. Trump's picks. Um, what's your sense of how they're going to do it? Resist everything? Pick your shots? Is there one marquee battle to watch? They're going to have to pick their battles because uh, almost to a person, these nominees, Democrats believe, um, are antithetical to the positions they intend to hold. They uh, think, for example, that if you uh, don't believe that the environment is in trouble, uh, you shouldn't be running the EPA and on and on. However, Democrats also want to be able to make a larger point, uh, not just about this nominee or that nominee, but that in general they believe that the Trump administration is outside the mainstream. And if you've got every Senate Democrat um, making that case against every single nominee, that message is going to get lost. So they will try to pick a few uh, marquee nominees to really go after in public hearings to try to get a lot of attention. Beyond getting attention, it's not clear that there's much that they can do to stop any of these nominations, and they know that because they simply don't have the numbers. What are your quick thoughts on Chuck Schumer? Uh, Mitch McConnell famously told Major Garrett that uh, he wanted to keep President Obama to being a one-term president. Is that the way Chuck Schumer, as the leader of the Democrats in the Senate, is positioning himself against Donald Trump, or does he have another view? I'm not sure that's in his DNA. 
So there are some Democrats to be obstructionist. Who, to, to, he to, wants to make to a be deal. Obstructionist. He likes to make a deal. Chuck Schumer uh, does want to cut a deal, uh, for instance, on infrastructure spending, um, even though there are going to be some in his own party who say, if you cut a deal with Donald Trump on that or anything else, you are going to send a message to the rest of the country uh, that he is someone who can get things done, and we shouldn't allow that to happen. David, let me uh, ask you about terrorism because it was talked about so much by Donald Trump in the campaign. He said he wanted a 30-day plan to take care of ISIS. What's your sense of where that battle stands when the president inherits it? Well, he's going to uh, inherit a battle in which uh, ISIS is just losing ground by the day. Uh, they've lost half the territory they once held in Iraq. Um, and the Battle of Mosul is going to be long and it's going to be ugly. But the city's surrounded. They're going to lose. So geographically, ISIS is losing. But of course, as everybody points out, it's the idea that you have to kill as well. You might get lucky, kill al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, and that will somehow collapse the whole impetus behind the movement. But I doubt it. Hard to kill an idea. Hard to kill an idea. So I think whatever uh, Donald Trump inherits on the ground, the real battle is, is going to be in the air for, for the battle of ideas. And there, there is a lot of concern, John, once mm. they squeeze ISIS on the battlefield and Al-Qaeda on the battlefield, that they will, the killers will then spread out across Western Europe and maybe try to come here to the U.S. And I'd say <clears throat> the, the next question is, okay, so ISIS falls, then what happens on the day after? Uh, we've heard <clears throat> the president-elect criticized the current president for leaving a vacuum in the Middle East, failure, that disappearing red line in Syria, the failure to prevent atrocities. So if you take out ISIS in Syria or in Iraq, how do you actually build up a government that can keep a functioning military this time, right? How do you prevent repeating the mistakes that they've criticized the Obama administration for? I would say watch really carefully what happens in Syria. That is going to be such a litmus test because of that articulation of American weakness there that Trump has hit Obama on. Does he choose to see this as a battlefield against Iran, which has strengthened its hold on the region and the Iranian-backed militias, or does he see this as a way to partner with the Russians who have backed Iran, who have backed Assad, who are carrying out those atrocities that the U.S. calls a war crime? You know, the, the Obama administration has struggled mightily not to be distracted by anything in Syria other than the war against ISIS. Do not get involved in the civil war. And I, I can't imagine that, that uh, General Mattis wouldn't have the same advice uh, to President Trump. Whether or not President Trump follows that advice is another question. But he also right. likely sees it as not a civil war anymore. It's a ground war with Iran. It's an air war with Russia. And if you want to solve some of the problems when you look at Europe, that refugee crisis, mm -hmm. that flow of terrorists that Jeff was talking about, the beating heart of that is in Syria. And you need to address that in some way. Maybe it's not the ground troops that President Obama said were the only answer and the one that he shut down, but he's got to do something. And if it's safe havens and you ask the regional allies for money and they say no, hmm. and it's not a real estate transaction, it's actually hardball geopolitics where the Saudis and others say, no, we're not going to pony up. You told all the people in America we would, guess what, we won't. The safe havens that Donald Trump wants to create and have the Saudis pay for. Exactly. Yeah. And, and if, if that doesn't happen, then where, then where are you left? You're if back Trump, where the Obama administration has been for struggling for six years. If it's safe havens, does that mean you're willing to shoot down a Russian aircraft? Right, right. to protect them. That's yeah. a bit of an art. Even if they are paid for. Too, yeah. Because the, the president has leaned into this idea of humanitarian corridors, that it's not even a no-fly zone as we describe it. So there's some, some mushiness here in terms of what that could actually mean. Let me move on to our final round here, which is predictions for the year of 2017. Jeff, I'm going to start with you. Oh, great. Um, I want to, I, what, give us a prediction about something that's going to happen in 2017 or a clever way to get out of the question. Well, <laughs> listen, I, uh, I was struggling over this one because I, I felt like, you know, I could go the easy route and say something about ISIS, but I'm going to go the harder route and talk about James Comey, frankly, because where will he be? in January. I think he will be at the FBI. Uh, there are a lot of people in Washington who might disagree with that. 
but I've talked to sources who say that he he's spoken in groups of retired agent and agents, and he's 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 been very comfortable there, and he's defended his decisions as something that he had to do given the cards that he was dealt. So I think he stays at the FBI. He's comfortable with retired agents, but doesn't want to become one. Nancy, <laughs> uh, what's your prediction for 2017? I think by the end of the year, you will see a new democratic organization that does not currently exist, that does not currently exist, designed to try to uh, reach some of these white working class voters that the Clinton administration, was, uh, the Clinton campaign wasn't able to reach um, in 2016. You've got a number of high-ranking Clinton campaign officials who thought they were going to spend the next four years very busy at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, now looking for a new purpose. David, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts for 2017? Well, the bar is low because everybody's been so wrong <laughs> all the time about, uh, about Donald Trump. I, I will uh, predict that he will meet personally with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, and attempt to cut a deal that would somehow at least uh, freeze the uh, North Korean nuclear weapons program. Major. A year from now, we will be writing about Vice President Mike Pence, the most important person in the Trump administration, because at every personnel level, at every turn, he will have won more than he's lost. And whatever the ideology of President Trump is, the personnel implementing it will be at almost every vital turn selected, vetted, and recommended by Mike Pence. And in more ways than Dick Cheney, a very powerful vice president. All right. Jan Crawford. I'm well, I was going to stick with something that is much more predictable, and that is that Alabama is going to win the national championship <laughs> again oh, for the hello. fifth time. I mean, that's something I think we can all say. The odds yes, are higher. The, sun's, political the sun political rises, reason. the sun sets, exactly. Alabama wins. So These roll are, tide. Yeah. That's my prediction. And also, is that good enough? Or do you want a serious one? Because <laughs> we know that's going to happen. That's really not much of a prediction. I think that the Supreme Court, Supreme Court um, confirmation fight is going to be the biggest battle that we will see. I think it's going to be a place for Democrats to kind of put all their pent up rage and frustration at what happened in November. Uh, you're going to see a real effort to block President Trump's nominee to the Supreme Court. My prediction is that will fail. All right. And Margaret, your prediction for No Minnesota. sleep for any of us for the entire year and frequent uh, confrontations, small scale or otherwise, with both Iran pushing the limits of its nuclear program and seeing if the Trump administration enforces it and with North Korea, which is about scheduled for another test sometime soon. A busy year. Thank you all for being here at the end. And that's it for our Correspondents Roundtable. I want to thank all of you for being here, and we'll be back in a moment.